Residents and emergency services are on a high alert. This despite saying the danger of a possible radioactive cloud reaching the area is minimal, as the wind is expected to blow towards the Pacific Ocean. However, some tourists and foreign workers are leaving the area. Our correspondent, Yekaterina Grachova, is in the Sakhalin region. That's about, uh, about 100 kilometers just north of Japan. Emergencies officials for the Sakhalin region have intensified checks for radiation levels here in the Sakhalin region. Uh, we talked to representatives of the ministry. They showed us a car which they equipped with professional Geiger meters which would measure radiation levels at different places around the city. So the emergencies ministry here assures that as of Tuesday morning there is no increase in radiation levels and there is no cause uh, for the residents to panic. In the worst case scenario, locals can make respiratory masks at home. There's no threat to the health of the Sakhalin people. Radiation readings are at a normal level. Meanwhile, Russia's defense ministry says that it is ready to send out its personnel from the Kuril Islands anytime soon. This is the closest part of this region to North Japan. And also sales of iodine have rocketed in pharmacies across the city. Obviously, people want to make sure that they are well prepared in case that there is a radioactive emission threat. From what we know from people we've spoken to is that they are not quite sure whether Japanese are playing down the threat of a nuclear catastrophe or not. Please leave the international airport of Yuzhna Sakhalinsk according to the schedule. And from what we know, there are no additional flights arranged. Well, people here indeed are not new to natural disasters such as tsunamis and earthquakes. But with a nuclear threat in place, it seems that they have to be prepared for the unknown. And a lot depends on the wind. It is very crucial. So what people should be closely monitoring now is weather forecasts. It will take a radioactive cloud if there is an explosion inside a core of a nuclear reactor less than a day to reach this part of Russia. Yeah, Katerina Gretsch over reporting right there. Well, uh, so far, scientists say that winds are blowing from the east, so the radiation will head to the Pacific Ocean. Go to Ati's Twitter page to find out how the radioactive threat from the afflicted reactors is likely to spread. And uh, Austrian scientists, uh, they created an animated map of the radioactive cloud movement. And we can see here that in the worst case scenario, it could reach uh, the U.S. western coast there of California. And um, you can always uh, check out RT's Twitter account for the direct link to this. And uh, that's RT underscore com. Well, Moscow is expanding its aid to Japan, with the number of Russian emergency workers involved in rescue operations expected to grow over the next few days. The country is also boosting its humanitarian aid and energy supplies. RT's Peter Oliver has more from the Russian capital. Hello to you, Peter. So uh, talk to us about the extent of Russia being involved here. They're, they're heading uh, energy supplies. They're giving some sort of relief equipment. Uh, what, what, what items do you know of? Well, there's already Russian rescue workers and aid workers on the ground in Japan, and the numbers are expected to increase over the next couple of days so to around 180. Now, these rescue workers and aid workers are what's termed an autonomous rescue team by the emergency ministry here in Russia. What that means is they're a rapid response unit. They're ready to go as soon as they hit the ground, uh, and they don't require any additional help from the Japanese authorities. So. They, can, uh, they won't be taking any people away from Japan's already overstretched um, rescue teams that are working right there. Now, it's not just rescuers that will be heading out there and are already on the ground in Japan. It's also humanitarian aid. So we're looking at tents and shelters for those that have lost their homes. Also things like food, water and medicine. Now, we hear that Russia have also said that they will um, provide any help to Japan that they can should Japan request it. There's also a team of nuclear physicists in Russia's Far East that are ready to go to Fukushima should they be requested for any help that they could give there um, and it's not just this humanitarian aid we're also seeing energy aid being sent from Russia to Japan they're increasing the supplies of coal between the two countries there's also um, 150,000 tons of liquid gas that will be sent from Russia to Japan and a le electricity can be provided directly to Japan to an underwater cable but it's also as you've seen a massive outpouring of support here in Russia for the Japanese people. Over the weekend, there were flowers being laid outside of the Japanese embassy. And in an act of solidarity between the two nations, Prime Minister Vladimir Putin has invited the, Rus the Japanese judo team to come over here to Russia to train. 
Well, the situation in Fukushima has caused many countries around the world to review their own nuclear program. Now, Russia has said that their nuclear program will continue and is safe. Now, this was said by the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov. He also said that not only was the Russian nuclear air program safe, but that the Bushehr nuclear power plant in Iran, which Russia built, was also safe and able to withstand an earthquake. As for our cooperation with Iran in construction of the Bushehr nuclear plant, we are following the highest standards for safety. These standards are set by the IAEA, not Iran, and the UN Energy Watchdog monitors that. The entire facility is under the full oversight of the agency, and this guarantees not only technical safety, but also protection from seismic activity. Well, as the situation continues to worsen by the day in Fukushima, it really brings into the foreground the, the realisation that, that mankind, how, how much is mankind in control when it comes to technology and that technology being impacted upon by the forces of nature. They have, have been raised, but not significantly and are not uh, presenting any immediate danger to residents of the Japanese capital. Of course, at the same time, you have to remember that the levels uh, of radiation around the plants are such that uh, uh, thousands of people have already been evacuated and uh, tens of thousands have been told to keep their doors and windows shut and do not leave their homes. So at some, po at some point, there were reports that uh, uh, radioactivity levels of just north of Tokyo have been, um, uh, have been about 33 times the norm. So that is the situation that we're looking at right now. And of course, the IAEA is also saying that uh, radiation levels are going to uh, are going to uh, uh, to rise in, in the nearest future as the radiation uh, reaches uh, Tokyo. So we're keeping a close watch on uh, whether or not we're going to have any further reaction from the Japanese authorities uh, once uh, the, uh, the radiation levels in the Japanese capital may actually rise as well. Uh, we also know that pills with iodine have been uh, more than 200,000 pills with iodine have been released by IAEA and uh, sent off uh, to the areas affected uh, the most. 2,500 people have been confirmed dead. Thousands are missing, so the number is probably going. To, the number is going to change in the next couple of days. At this point, of course, the main concern is with the possible radioactive meltdown, nuclear meltdown, and that is what everybody is keeping a close eye on. But of course, uh, the um, the rescue efforts are still continuing. Uh, though, of course, countries, various countries, helping uh, Japan in that regard. There is not that many people out on the streets. It's very, very quiet. It's almost a morose feeling. Uh, you would imagine Tokyo to be a a city bursting with life and activity. There is hardly anybody out on the streets right now. People that are out, they're all wearing facial masks. Uh, also, there have been reported, also shortages of some foods have been reported. People are increasingly buying such things as water and uh, fish products and uh, uh, some of the things have been disappearing off the shelves. But again, they're doing it in a very orderly uh, fashion and manner. There's no panic. Obviously, something is in the air, so to speak. And it's not just radiation. It's probably fear and apprehension as people are still waiting for what's going to happen next. Irina Galushka there. Well, for more on the situation in Japan, let's now talk to Jan Haverkamp. He's a nuclear power expert at Greenpeace in Brussels. Thanks very much for joining us here on RT. Now, many experts are <laughs> rejecting fears of a possible nuclear disaster, but we've already had three explosions in as many days with reports of radiation reaching harmful levels. What's your assessment of the situation from what you know so far? Well, three explosions and, uh, and a hydrogen fire in a spent fuel pool. And for, especially that last one was, um, was the reason for the soaring uh, radi radioactivity levels that we saw then afterwards. Um, the situation at this moment remains critical. It will remain critical for several days. Uh, the, the operators there, and they have to work with there's only 50 people allowed on the plant at the moment and they work in 15 minute shifts which is which is very little and they have to work very many things by hand because remote control installations have gone down uh, the main operator room is is not usable because of high radiation levels they're working under extremely difficult circumstances to try to prevent the worst from the worst which would which would indeed be a core that is completely dry and that would would lead to a meltdown now given 
the shortage of, of cooling water and, and pumping capacity that there is at the moment, that chance is still, is still existing and that will exist for several days to come. Many people talking about meltdown. What does that mean exactly? Yeah. What are the implications of a meltdown? For, in case of a meltdown, what we would see would be a core that is completely dry. So the fuel would be completely standing dry, not being cooled anymore. The heat that is still coming off and that is in the order of magnitude of several megawatts still, um, would make the, the, the core melt uh, falling down. The, 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 fuel would, the fuel would come out of its, its uh, pipes, so to speak. It would fall down on the floor. There would be hydrogen uh, produced in, in larger amounts, which probably would cause uh, an explosion. Um, it either would melt through the uh, metal of the reactor vessel or it would explode through it. Okay, um, so what, in that okay. case, in that case it, it would get into the atmosphere. Right, yeah. so this is an explosion of radioactive material. Uh, what impact would uh, such a catastrophe have, not just in Japan, but when you're talking about a massive amount of radioactive material released into the atmosphere mm -hmm. and indeed into the, into the water, into the sea, what impact, ecological impact, could that have in a wider area, in the Asian Pacific region and beyond? That is very difficult to estimate. We remember that we've had uh, several of those accidents before. Mayak 1957, Chernobyl 1986. We've had, of course, the nuclear bomb tests. But all of these are very specific, and also this catastrophe is very specific. It is very early now to predict what would happen, because it would depend on how much of the material would get out. It would depend on what the sea streams would be, what the wind would be. Um, what is certain is that the spread of this material in the air would not go as far as that we've seen with Chernobyl. The reason for that is that it will not be boosted as high in the air because there is no graphite in it like, like in, the, in the Chernobyl reactor. That means that most of the radioactivity would fall nearer to the nuclear power station, but there it would create larger havoc than we've seen it in the case of, of Chernobyl. Also keep in mind that the surroundings of, of these nuclear power stations are a lot more densely habitated than we than we had known uh, in the case of Chernobyl. Uh, you're, so you're, you're, we haven't got a lot of time. You're from Greenpeace, um, and your yeah. stance on nuclear energy is pretty widely known. You would prefer not to have nuclear yeah. energy. What impact could this have then on the future of nuclear power, not just in Japan but around the world now? There was talk about a renaissance of nuclear power, and I think this might be one of the factors that brings the reality to the people. And the reality is that nuclear power is on its way out. Um, there are less new power stations coming online uh, than there are switched offline already for, for over but, a decade. But, but nuclear power is safe in Europe, isn't it? I mean, Europe doesn't face tsunamis no. and, and, and earthquakes. Is, is it not safe and clean in Europe? Um, also, we have earthquakes. Uh, also, we have uh, natural catastrophes. And if there's one thing that we've learned from the Japanese experience, it is that if you are hit by, let's say, an earthquake as a natural disaster, the last thing you want to see is you also have to spend part of your capacity preventing a nuclear catastrophe. If, if an earthquake happens in Bulgaria or Romania, it also will have devastating effects on the nuclear level. Um, that is something that we would have to, have to prevent. Also in Germany or in France, those are also seismic active areas. Jan Havakamp, nuclear power expert at Greenpeace, joining us live there in Brussels. Thanks for joining us on RT. You're welcome. The emergency response meeting here in Brussels uh, has been raised from expert to ministerial level. That means all 27 EU energy ministers have been called to, uh, to Brussels to really coordinate an emergency response. Gunter Ertinger, the EU energy commissioner, says we need to see if we can provide an energy policy for the EU that uh, avoids nuclear energy. Of course, it's a, it's a flip. It's really a change from the traditional energy policy of many countries in the European Union, which was to increase its nuclear capacities, because Italy, for example, is a big EU country which is starting from scratch a big nuclear program. France, Belgium here also uh, have big nuclear programs, but now there is increasing concern about the safety, obviously, of uh, nuclear reactors, and there is growing public opposition to that now. There was a demonstration of around 60,000 people in Germany uh, near four nuclear reactors there. And if to give you a flavour of the sentiment here, 
here in Brussels. Let me just quote from the Portuguese uh, State Secretary for the Environment who said, in the light of the nuclear meltdown in Japan, member states need to reconsider their energy policy and uh, related security measures. Nuclear power is neither a safe option nor is it sustainable. The 100-plus uh, nuclear plants across the European Union are now conducting stress tests to see whether uh, a similar accident could happen in the European Union.